Yeah. 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 I hope you guys are ready to hear the word of God this morning. So I'm going to make an agreement with you this morning that I'm going to give you my whole heart. All I ask for in return is that you repay me that. Just give me your heart. Give me your heart this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you, CL. But before we get started, why don't we open up with a word of prayer? Amen. You know, you God, we are so grateful to be here this morning. The fact that we get to worship you every single week is nothing short of a miracle. The fact that we woke up this morning is a miracle. The fact that we get to celebrate our mothers today is a miracle. Lord, I am so grateful and thankful for all the ways that you love us and take care of us. Lord, please have mercy on us as we are wretched sinners and we need your forgiveness daily. But I also pray, Lord, that you would move me aside this morning and speak through me. Allow me to be just a vessel to preach your message to your people. I love you so much. And just I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, this week has been an amazing week. Mm. There's been a lot of fundraising opportunities. <laughs> you know, I'm going to lift up the SOAR Campus Ministry who... Did an awesome fundraiser at, I believe it's pronounced Bueno, uh, which is like an Italian beef spot. The, the, food, the food is pretty good. Like I said, I'm not from here. I'm from Milwaukee. I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. I work on it. I'll do my best. <laughs> no. But as well, I want to lift up the COD Campus Ministry, who's been doing bake sales like every day. In particular, I want to lift up Karen and Julia. And I want to... Thank Garrett's mom for letting Garrett use her kitchen. <laughs> Taking a captive every night to make the baked goods. Amen. But as well, uh, I want to lift up the Harvester's Bible Talk. They did something very amazing yesterday. They went to the Naperville Riverwalk, and they, they just preach scriptures. And they asked for donations. And that's so inspiring to see people get creative during this time of missions. And not only that, today is a very special day. Who knows what today is? I sure hope you guys remember. Because if there's mothers in your life and you forgot, you're going to be hearing about it tomorrow. Amen? And you know, I love, I love my mom. And I love all the mothers of my life. I actually have a slide of Garrett, if you would, please. All the mothers that have... Then in my, my mom's side of the family, uh, there's there's more. That's my dad's side of the family. So I wonder why they all look so much like my mom, just because they're all like my mom's side of the family. <laughs> but uh, this picture right here, this is my, my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother. As you see up here, this is this is my older, my older brother. This is me, and this is my mom. This is my mom and her mom, and this little fat little thing right here, that's me. Um, but I love all these women for many different reasons. You know, my great-grandmother was one of the kindest women I ever had the pleasure of knowing. I remember I'd go to her house, and, and she, would just, she would just listen to me talk, and, and I'm sure I was talking about nothing. And she, she still listened, amen. And then my grandma, a little, what, what an awesome, humble woman she is. Probably one of the hardest, work, women, I, hardest working women that I know. But not only that, she's extremely humble. There's so many accolades that my grandma has achieved that I, I, I genuinely did not know until somebody else brought it up to me. Did you know grandma did this? And I was like, no, she didn't. And then I'd ask my grandma, she's like, yeah, I did that. I'd be like, well, why didn't you tell me? She's like, that's none of your business. <laughs> and then, of course, my mom, I'm a little impartial because without her, I wouldn't be here. So my mom over here is, is, is awesome. She's one of my best friends. Alongside with my dad, of course, and my brother. I love all my family. Actually, my family came here to visit. They would stand up and then wave for their grandma. If you guys have any issues with me, take it up with them before you leave. Because it's their fault. Thank you, Gary. You can. But I'm so grateful for my mom in particular because her and my dad did the very thing that I, I know is the reason I'm here today. They instilled 
a love for God in me. Hmm. I would not be here without my parents. And I would not be here without my, my siblings. And for my family, I'm just eternally grateful. But you know what's so amazing is that God prioritized women. Hmm. He also prioritized mothers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, God or Jesus in his ministry gave very special positions to the women. True. In fact, Jesus valued women so much that when he came back from the dead, he did not go to Peter. He did not go to John. No, he came to the women first. Okay. Yeah. Now, sometimes as men, we can want to talk about all the mighty men of the Bible. <laughs> I want to be like David. I want to be like Paul. Oh. And those are good people to be like. Yeah. <laughs> but have you ever, as a man, just like studied out mothers? And said, you know what? I want to I wanna be more like this woman. Probably not. <laughs> a lot of the men are probably like, no, I don't do that. Why would I want to be like a woman? I want to be a man. <laughs> but you know, you can learn a lot. If you would just sit down and listen. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that to you. I'm saying that to me because I have a bad, I, I'm very bad at it. You can ask Courtney. I, I do my best. I'm working on it. Amen. But with it being Mother's Day, we are going to talk about three different mothers in the Bible this morning. And we're going to talk about three qualities that these women possess that if we instill in our relationship with God, it will move him to help you. Come on. The title of my lesson is this, Motherly Qualities That Move God's Heart. Point number one, Hannah moved God with her prayer. Hmm. The first mother that we're going to discuss this morning is Hannah. And she was the mother of Samuel. And if you guys don't know about Samuel, well, he's got two books. You can read through it and you'll see, kind of see what he did. But before Hannah gave birth to Samuel, she was struggling to give birth. In fact, it it was pretty much impossible. And there was another one of uh, her husband's wives. And, you know, I don't know why that man had two wives, but we ain't going to talk about that right now. And she was kind of a hater. She was like, "Uh uh-huh, look at all my children. (laughs) But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that. Amen. We're going to pick it up in verse 9. We're going to talk about Hannah's prayer to God. In verse 9, it says this. Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair uh, by the doorstep, the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to you, give him, uh, I'm sorry, give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. And she kept on, and she kept on praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth, uh, observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her, uh, uh, Hannah praying in her heart. And her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went, uh, went, uh, went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, and they went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah, I don't know how to pronounce his name, made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant, and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. And you know, what's very interesting is when Hannah was in deep anguish, it looked weird to people around her. You see, Eli was kind of like, hey, why are you coming to the temple drunk? And sometimes we can be deep in prayer and praying for things, that doesn't make sense to other people. There you go. And then at that point, Hannah had to make a choice. Was I, am I going to stop praying? 
Am I going to be like, oh, yeah, sorry, I, I, and, and, and not deny it? Or am I going to stand up for what I was actually doing? Stand up for her prayer. But God saw Hannah's heart. Yeah. And he saw that her heart was broken. And she was willing to do the hardest thing that any mother could ever do. I know my mom, if, if somebody came to my mom and was like, hey, we, we got to kill one of your sons. My mom would be like, nope, not going to happen. You take me. You, you can't, you cannot, you cannot take my child. I appreciate what, what Brianna shared earlier yeah. about Abraham and the heart that Abraham showed that, hey, I trust you, God, enough to sacrifice my son. But sometimes we pray for things and we're not willing to give something back to God because of the prayer. Okay. You know, sometimes we'll pray for something not knowing that God's going to ask for something in return. And then when we do, we get indignant. How dare you? But if we read, we know that Hannah gives birth to a son later and it becomes Samuel. And if you know anything about Samuel, Samuel was crucial to the beginning of, of the kingdom of Israel in a lot of ways. He anoints King Saul, who was the first king of all, of, of all Israel. Yeah. And then he anointed what the Jewish people would say was the best king of all time, David. Yeah. Samuel had a crucial role in the kingdom. Yeah. And Hannah, even though she loved her son, was willing to give up Samuel so that God's will could be fulfilled. Amen. And we see later on in, in, in chapter two, of, uh, in first Samuel chapter two, verse 21, Hannah gave birth to three sons and two daughters. So God did not forget her sacrifice. In fact, he blessed her with more children because of the children that she was willing to give back to God. And God wants to answer your prayers. But where are, your, where are you coming from? Where's your heart at when you're praying? Sometimes we come to God with a greedy and stingy heart and wonder why he isn't moving. We have the audacity to say, God, you don't love me because you didn't give me what I asked. But when, was John, when did God ever agree to be your genie? When did God ever agree that anything you pray for, I'm going to give it to you? That was never the agreement. God said that he would do what was best for you to yeah. get him closer to him. Not the, Let's not get that twisted here, church. We don't pray to get what we want. We should be praying to get closer to God. Yeah. But Hannah had a humble heart, and her heart was, an okay, was, was, was okay with the answer being no or not yet. Mm. Come on, great point. Are you okay if you pray for something? And the answer is no. Are you okay if you pray for something and the answer is you need to wait? Because sometimes we get so caught up in what we want that we forget the process and what it's trying to teach us. Mm. That's what's so amazing about what Hannah did. Is that Hannah didn't allow herself to get caught up in whether this gets answered or not. She wanted a close relationship with God. And she made a request and God granted her request because of her heart and how humble she was and, and her willingness to sacrifice. I want to lift up my, my own mom because there was a point in time, I can't remember exactly how old I was. I probably was in high school when this happened, but my mom lost, lost her job. And there was a false accusation brought against her. And I remember really my family being like really confused, like why would this person do such a thing and, and not really understanding what was going on at the moment. And there was some tears and sorrow shed for this, this situation. And surely enough, my mom prayed and she prayed and she prayed. And, you know, God really works in mysterious ways, but he works in, in very intentional ways as well. Because my mom did not only get a new job, but the, God, the job she got was better Better pay, better hours, better everything. And yet now, and, and, so, and yet sometimes we can, we can wonder whether God is with us. Amen. Yeah. You know, for us, we all have that story where we lost something or something was taken from us and we prayed and God gave us something better. Yeah. How easily do you forget the miracles that God has given you? It's very easy. Mm -hmm. To get into that mentality of, oh, I've, I've, I've gotten one miracle, but I want another. 
and I want another, and I want, and I want more and more and more. When's the last time you thanked God for what he's given you? When's the last time that you prayed, God, what do you want from me? When was the last time that you prayed, God, give me your heart and your vision for my life? Because a lot of the times we want God to move in this mysterious way. Give me this, give me this internship. Give me this job. Give me this promotion. Give me this money. Give me this boyfriend. Give me this girlfriend. Give me all these things. And then I'll think about coming back to you, God. Mm-hmm. Instead of, God, is, is, if this is your will, give it to me. But if it's not, I'm okay with it not, be, not happening. If we look in 1 Thessalonians, not only must we have the right heart, but let's look at what else we must do. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I love the, I love the Bible because it's, there's, there's parts of the Bible that are very nuanced and you have to find the nuggets. <laughs> and I also love the parts of the Bible that are, sometimes I can feel a little bit more written to me. Do this, don't do that. And now those are my favorite bu- verses in the Bible. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, it says this, Rejoice all of it. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So I love that, like I said, the scripture is very to the point. Yeah. You don't have to wonder what the author was trying to say here. You don't read this and go, I wonder what he meant by that. <laughs> Rejoice always means to be joyful always. Yeah. We need to pray with joy on every occasion. Even when times are tough. Mm. <laughs> you know, sometimes we can go into the world and complain about all of the bad things happening in our life and then wonder why they don't want to come to church with us. <laughs> They're like, because your life sucks. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> when was the last time you boasted about God in your workplace? Man, God did this for me today. God did that for me this week. God did this. God did this. this, this. But we're so quick to be critical. Yeah. We're not very quick to be grateful, though, are we? Oh, come on. Number, verse 17 is, is very simple as well. It's pray continually. Yeah. Sometimes we pray for one day, and then the prayer doesn't get answered, and we're like, well, guess it's not God's will. God was like, I don't just want you to pray a little longer. I'm going to see if you're really willing to <laughs> But you know, we go, oh, well, maybe next year. <laughs> and then verse 18 says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. Oh. Right. A lot of people you talk to say, I want to live out God's will. Yeah. yeah, I want to live according to God's will for my life. Show them this, show them this verse. Mm. Are you giving thanks in all circumstances? Even when it's tough, are you still giving thanks to God? Because it's easy to give thanks when everything's going right. Anybody can do that. I've seen people give thanks to God when they win an NBA championship. That's easy. I just want to thank God for the championship that I just won. Great job. (laughs) When somebody wins an Oscar, first and foremost, I just want to thank God. Well, what are they doing after they they get their award? Are they still giving thanks to God or are they giving thanks to themselves? Good point. It's real, bro. You know, sometimes we can be like that. Yeah. When everything's going well. Thank you, God. I love you. But let God give you a trial, and now God's a mean and harsh and unwarranted God. He doesn't love me anymore, and all these things come out, and the truth comes out of your heart. Right. But maybe you don't need to work on your prayer life this morning. Maybe your prayer life's set. Cool. We'll go to this point number two. Maybe God is calling you to increase your faith, which leads to point number two. Sarah moved God with faith. You know... The next mother we're going to be talking about is Sarah, the wife of Abraham, the man who lied about their marital status multiple times. <laughs> man, don't do that. It may not work out the same way that it did for Abraham. Amen. But we see something very interesting 
about God and the way that he tested Abraham and Sarah. Because he said, you are going to be the mother and father of the nations, but waited until they were way beyond the years of giving birth. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that would have been like a struggle for me to believe. Sure. Like, I'd have been like, God, I'm like 157. Like, I ain't got it. <laughs> I'm done. And then God's like, do you trust me? And then you got to ask yourself the real questions. Like, do I trust him? But everybody be like, I trust the God. And then you go home and you're like, I don't know. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> but that's what Sarah was going through. Yeah. She had to believe that in her old age, that God was still going to fulfill his promise. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Sure. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this chapter. It's known as the Hall of Faith. Some people call it. But let's pick it up in verse 1. It says this. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We see here that having faith is having confidence, having hope, having assurance in something that has not happened yet or you have not seen happen. It doesn't take any faith to pray for something you've already seen happen. Yeah. It, it doesn't require you to step out on a ledge and believe if you've already seen it happen. You know, Omar and my mom and, and, my, and my brother, Sean, they're all great big Warriors fans. I don't get it. You guys live in the Midwest. They're in Oakland. They don't care. There's a player on the Golden State Warriors by the name of Steph Curry. And it doesn't take me any time to believe that Steph Curry can make a three-point shot. It also doesn't take any faith for me to believe that LeBron James can kick Steph Curry's butt. He's done it. I can see it with my own team. And I'm going to have this with Paul It happened. But it also doesn't take any faith for me to believe that AJ is going to be at church. Yeah. I'll see and if, and if, and if anything, when AJ's not here, I'm like, where's AJ at? Who, who's going to call AJ? Because he needs to be here. We're going to fall apart without him. We love AJ. But if we read in verse 11, it says this. And, fa and by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear a child because she considered him faithful who made the promise. God. The reason, according to this scripture, that Sarah was able to even have a child so beyond her years was because of her faith. Yeah. So you want to see something happen. Here's the answer. Yeah. Where's your faith at today? You know, I want to lift up. I, I love all the mothers in the outer west. I want to make that very clear. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to get in trouble later. I don't want to be like, bro, what were you thinking? I love all the mothers. And all the mothers have a very special place in my heart. Today I'm going to lift up two of them. Amen. And the only reason I'm going to lift up these two is because they're in my Bible talk. So I get to see them on a weekly basis. The two mothers I want to lift up are Brianna Johnson and Bono. Yeah. And I really am grateful for these two mothers. Come on. These two mothers are, are very special because they're, they're single mothers. And, and the reason it's so special and near and dear to my heart is because my mom was a single mother. And I remember hearing the story about my mom being a single mom and coming to what was then the ICOC and, and feeling loved and encouraged enough to become a disciple. And I'm always grateful for the church taking care of single moms. Yep. But I'm also grateful for Brianna and Bana's decision. There you go. Come on. They had to step out on faith and make a decision not only for themselves, but for their children. And I'm grateful for that because now they are allowing Niall and Xavier and Braxton and all the other kids in that room the opportunity to know what it means to truly love God. Yeah. 
But not only that, I've seen Vana and Brianna change before my very eyes. There you go. I remember when I first got here, and Brianna's like, I want, we're going to make a difference. And I was like, hey, man, we're going to do it. <laughs> but she wasn't lying. You know, sometimes people be like, we're going to make a difference. And then week two, you're like, where are you at? Where you go? <laughs> I'm grateful for these, for these women because they, they have faith. They have determination. They have grit. But they're willing to work hard for God. And, and, and trust that God will take care of them. For us here in the outer west to move God in May, we must believe that he is going to do what he promised. And if you are tempted to doubt, I would encourage you to read through this chapter. Hebrews chapter 11. Full and full of people and stories of people who could have doubted. But they chose not to. They chose to have faith in God and we got to see the byproduct. Yes. If you believe in God and you believe in the Bible and you read that chapter and you still don't believe, I'm talking to Asia. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Read it again. We need to gain a conviction on our faith, guys. Yeah, come on. Come on, We need to gain a conviction that God is with us. Yeah. Because he's the only one who's going to move the outer west. I love her. Acts. Because it talks about how people, the, the uh, apostles were unschooled, ordinary men. And when I read that chapter, I'm like, oh, God, you talking about me. I don't remember it. Maybe the lower. But with God, we can change. With God, he can move someone's heart. Because I love you guys. And I think all of you guys are awesome, but by yourself, you're not moving nobody's heart. You're just not that special. I'm sorry. I love you. I think you're awesome, but you need God. So now that we know that we must pray and we need to have unshakable faith, let's go to point number three. Mary moved God with her humility. Come on. The final mother that we're going to look at this morning is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And let's go to Luke chapter one, where we're, we're going to pick up the story. Come on, Quinton. Good Come stuff, on, bro. bro. Oh, man. You would have thought I knew what Luke was, eh? Hey? <laughs> um, you can do it. It's in the Bible. Thank you, bro. <laughs> Luke chapter 1, verse 25 says this. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, the angel Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be a great, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, uh, uh, forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel a uh, answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the most high will overshadow you so that, uh, so the Holy One to be born with will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, and she uh, who was said to be unable to conceive, in, is in her sixth month. For no word, no, no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Are you as humble to God's vision for your life as Mary? 
Because if you think about it, if you think about it, what God was asking Mary to take on was, was very tough. He was asking Mary to take on emotional trial, physical trial, mental trial, persecution from the town, being ostracized in some ways. And not only that, was calling her to believe what was going to happen is actually going to happen. But she was willing to give up everything for God. She was willing to give up everything to serve God. And how far are you willing to serve God today? Are you willing to move? Are you willing to give up your job? Are you willing to sacrifice your comfort for the sake of the gospel? In Luke chapter 9, let's look, let's look over there. We see this scripture a lot. And in fact, we read it a lot. And sometimes I think disciples can go, ah, I've heard it already. Yeah. Old scripture. But here's the funny thing about the Bible. If you don't apply it, it doesn't matter how many times you pray. But in verse 23, it says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily. This is a daily decision, church, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for, you, for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. We see here Jesus calls us to deny ourselves. But it's not something that you get to determine when you do it. <laughs> he doesn't say deny yourself when you feel like it. He doesn't say deny yourself one hour out of the day. Deny yourself only during Sunday service. Deny your No, every day. In every situation. At every time you must deny yourself. Come on, quit it. But not only that. God makes it very clear here in verse 26. He says, if you are ashamed of me and my words, I will be ashamed of you. And you read that, and you can only be humble. Yeah, right. Because a lot of the times we look at God as the God who's, who, who loves everybody, who wants everybody to make it, and he does. But God has standards. Yes. And I find it so funny because we all have standards in our relationships. Yeah. Yep. I can't be married to somebody and then be unfaithful and then be mad when they leave. Right. <laughs> I can't be a friend to somebody and only take, take, take. And then when they say, hey, I don't want this friendship anymore. Be like, mom, can you believe that this person didn't want to be friends with me anymore? All I did was like take $10,000 from them. <laughs> and now they don't want to be my friend anymore. My mom would be like, my mom would be like, you really don't know why? You really don't get it? <laughs> but yet God has standards too. Yeah. And God is a forgiving God. God is a loving God. But God also ain't just going to be sitting around and being your little puppet. Right, right. He expects some things from you. Come on. Come on. He expects you to talk to him. Yeah. He expects you to listen to him. He expects you to talk to other people about him. Yes. He expects you to further his mission. How has it been going, going after those things? But here's another thing. He expects us to be humble. We cannot expect us to grow in our relationship with God if we're prideful. We just can't. And you don't want to know how I know that? Because I tried to do it twice. I was the person who wanted to be prideful and have a relationship with God. You know how it always ended up? Me out in the, in the, in the cold, dark wilderness wondering what happened. Because I went back to my old way of life thinking that I knew better than God. 
I've shared about my mom. Another woman who's very impactful in my life is my grandma. My grandma Nakata is an extremely humble woman. And in 1995, when she studied the Bible, she was a mature mother of three. And she had a lot of wisdom. She had a lot of experience in her, in, in her life. And yet she was humble enough to be taught by younger people. She was humble enough to under, let somebody teach her what it meant to be a true follower of Jesus. And, you know, sometimes we, can, we cannot want to hear people out. Yeah, true. My question for you this morning is if Diego got up here and started preaching at y'all, would y'all listen? <laughs> Diego's 12 years old. And if he came up here and started preaching at me, I'd be like, let me take some notes. What are you talking about? <laughs> but sometimes we can find it hard to want to listen to somebody younger than us. Because we think that they don't know what they're talking about. Or they haven't lived the life that I have lived. But I'm here to talk to the younger people as well. Yeah. Do you listen to the people in your life who are older than you? And do you heed their advice and apply it to your life? Uh-huh. This is not a one-way street. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, bro. It's not all oh, the older people need to listen to the younger people. No, 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 no. Y'all need to listen to the older people too. You can learn something from them. If you don't want to make the same mistakes, maybe listen. Can't tell you how many times my mom was like, you shouldn't do that. You're going to end this way. And then I was like, nah. And then I went and did it. And it ended exactly the way she said. And she's like, I told you. But I'm sorry. Come here. (laughs) She had to get the I told you off first. (laughs) Man, my siblings were doing that to me too. They were like, oh, that's a stupid idea. And I was like, I think I got it. And then he'd be like, what you want me to say? I, th- I told you that was dumb. <laughs> Don't be like me. <laughs> Don't learn from your own mistakes. Learn from the mistakes of others so you can be wise. But Jesus doesn't call us to do something that we can't do. In fact, we see something very powerful in Matthew chapter 11. Come on, bro. Take it back. Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew 11, verse 28, it says this, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in spirit, or in heart, sorry. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So walking in that door this morning, how did you feel? Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'd be talking to people like, my week was so tough. Help me out. And I want to help you guys out. I would encourage you to read the scripture. Because sometimes we can get so caught up in the worries of this world. Satan's great at that, isn't he? Yeah. I'm going to give you this problem and that problem. And, oh, I'm going to throw a dash of this and a sprinkle of that. And then you're so worried about everything going on over here that you forget God back here, like, trying to bring you back. If you feel burdened this morning, it's not, I'm not not here to condemn you. I'm here to encourage you. Jesus is calling you to be humble enough to come under his yoke. But you know what that requires? Is it requires you putting down the pride that you believe you know better than God. It requires you being willing to let God lead you. And that's tough. For some of us, we've lived the life that we live currently for so long. And we believe that the way that we're doing is right. And there may be some aspects of your life that are. But Jesus never intended for anybody to live a burdensome life. He wouldn't have put this, he wouldn't have said this if he wanted you to live a tiresome life where you're just, oh my gosh, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so exhausted all the time. I, I, I've gotten the least amount of sleep in my life recently and have somehow managed to have the most amount of energy. 
The only way that the only way that it happens is because of God. DL and AJ call me a stray cat. They're like, I never see you, bro. You, you be coming in at the night and then leave in the morning. I'm like, amen, bro. I love you. But on top of that, sometimes we can, we can allow, like I said before, we can allow things to take us out. But if we are humble like Mary, it makes our life a whole lot. Yeah. Imagine if Mary would have worried about all the details that were going to, all the details that had to take place. But what about this? That, no, no, wait, wait, wait. wait. Hey, bro, that doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about? The Holy Spirit's going to come on me, and then I got to, and, and you start freaking out. Mary would have been like, would, her mind probably would have exploded. <laughs> but she didn't do that. No. No. She said that I am the, the Lord's son, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fulfill my, basically, I'm going to fulfill what you ask, ask him. Amen. But when you are humble, and you live under Jesus' yoke, God's yoke, it allows you to live life to the full. Mm. It allows you to live uh, a, a life that's, that's a little carefree sometimes. And as an adult, we can all understand how, how much of a, uh, a joy that is. Because there's all these things you got to focus on. But imagine, if you live under God's yoke, you can, you can live some, some laissez-faire life. And you can go roam in the meadows or whatever. Whatever sisters do, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure some brothers roam in the meadows, amen. Come on. Amen. <laughs> so this morning, I want to ask you, how are you doing in these areas towards God's mission? Come on. Because sometimes I can hear people be like, we do it, special mission. We Every week. But are you doing anything? About it? Because I can tell you I understand something, but if I'm not doing something about it, it doesn't really, tr it truly doesn't really make sense. Right. If, I, if my mom asked me to take out the garbage and I say I'm going to do it and then I don't, she's going to be like, you didn't hear me. Because I asked you to do something and I do it. God's asking you to be devoted to his mission. Are you praying for God's mission? Are you praying for the evangelization of the nation? Sometimes we, we go, why do we have to give money to missions? Because money makes the world go round. I'm sorry that that's the way that the world works. Right. Maybe if you don't want it to be that way, pray that God devalues money. I don't know what you want to do. Pray for something. <laughs> <laughs> or you can pray that God allows you to find a way to help make the mission. Do you have faith that it can happen? Because faith without faith or uh, actions without faith is dead. You know, you know, you can't you can't really be doing things without faith. It doesn't make any sense. But also, why would you pray without faith? Why would you pray without the belief that God is going to do? It? But you have to have the personal faith to act. God, I believe that I can help make this mission happen. Grant me success in what I'm going to do. You can't sit on your couch and catch fish. That doesn't, that's not how it works. <laughs> Are you humble to the people that God put in your life? All of us in the church have disciples. When was the last time you went up to your disciple and asked them what you need to work on? When was the last time that your disciple had told you what you needed to work on and you actually did it? Because there's a lot of the times that your disciple is like, bro, you need to do this better. And you're like, I got you, bro. And then you don't do anything. Then he's just talking. But finally, are you submissive to God's plan, God's plan for your life? Not to the plan that you have. Not to the plan that you think is the best. Are you submissive? to God's plan, your personal plan. Because sometimes we can get so caught up in what we want that we forget that it shouldn't be about what we want. It should be about what God wants. And I'm not saying that your plans are bad. But have you ever taken the time to ask God if they're good? Have you ever taken the time to ask God, are you with my plans? I don't think we have. 
I know it, it took me a while to, to even come to that realization. That man, I should probably ask God if he even likes what I'm doing. Or if I should give up. Amen. Amen. So in closing, come on. to move God in May, I want to give you three challenges. Challenge number one. We must pray more than ever before. If you are not praying more in the month of May than ever before, don't expect God to just all of a sudden just get up and do something. Point, challenge number two is have faith in God to believe that he is ready, willing, and able to do anything in your life. But trust that God knows what's best for you. And challenge number three, be humble and live under God's yoke. Church, I'm here to say that if we do these three challenges, we take on these three challenges in the month of May, that God's heart will be moved. And if we move God's heart, we can save the outer west. I love you and to God be all the glory.